911, what's the nature of your emergency? On New Year's Day, 2019, in Melbourne, Florida, a call came in from a home on Woods Mill Drive. No one was on the phone with the dispatcher at first, but it wasn't silent on the other end. The dispatcher heard screaming from a woman and a man and their children, and gunshots could also be heard. 39-year-old William Brian Stilwell and his wife, Mona, had recently separated on December 28th, and after the separation, Mona moved to her parents' home with her children, five-year-old twins, a boy and a girl. On New Year's Day, around 2 p.m., William Stilwell showed up uninvited to his wife's parents' home during a family get-together, carrying a 9mm semi-automatic pistol. Mona's father, Robert Snellgrove, told Stilwell to leave, but Stilwell became angry and cursed at Snellgrove, then headed to the backyard where he fired the first shot, hitting Snellgrove in the groin. After hearing the gunshots, Mona's mother came outside of her home to determine what was going on, then Stilwell proceeded to fire at her, hitting her in the abdomen and elbow. He fired several more rounds while cursing at other family members, all while the five-year-old twins were watching. On the call, you can hear the children in the background begging for their dad not to shoot and that they didn't want anyone to die. You can also hear Stilwell accusing his wife of cheating. He then told the two children who were watching and crying that he loved them, then fired another shot hitting his wife in the knee, leaving her unable to move. Now we're going to have the location to the emergency. Okay, stay on, the, stay on the phone. I need to get you through to medical. Don't hang up. Ma'am, who was who shot him? Shot victim 
Thankfully, the children were not physically harmed and were able to safely escape to a neighbor's home. Stillwell's wife and her parents were rushed to the hospital where they all later recovered from their injuries. Police set a perimeter on the home and after a 10 to 15 minute standoff, Stillwell finally surrendered peacefully to the officers. During a search of the parents' home, the gun that was used throughout the incident was found in the living room near a couch. After he was arrested, Stillwell made several random utterances to detectives, one of which was that he was upset because he had watched a video on a phone of his wife and his best friend sleeping together. He also called his wife a derogatory name several times. Stillwell is currently being held at the Brevard County Jail without bail. He was charged with armed burglary, use of a firearm during a felony, two counts of child abuse, and three counts of attempted murder. On July 16, 2009, a 911 call came in around 4 p.m. from a neighbor of 55-year-old Jolene Hardy about a deceased person at her home in Apex, North Carolina. When Hardy was handed the phone, she said she had come home around 3.30 p.m. to find her husband's beaten body and that he was cold and stiff. Sounding distraught, she told the dispatcher she had been looking for her husband the night before and earlier that day. Hardy feared for him because he had a history of mental problems and seemed to have a death wish after battling lymphoma for six years. She explained he often went to dangerous places hoping to be killed so he wouldn't die of the disease. However, her husband's family members said they were not aware that he had any serious illness. Hardy said she tried for about a half an hour to resuscitate her husband, 60-year-old Gerald Hardy, but had no luck, so she ran to her neighbor next door and placed the call to 911. Okay, and when you say he's down, what do you mean? She says he's, he's cold and he's not breathing. She says she's been trying to give him CPR. Okay. Is there any way you can get a phone, a cell phone, or something over there to him? Yeah, well, I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm giving it to her right here. Here she is, right here. Okay. About a year ago, they text police to stop him in the middle of the night going up toward Raleigh. Hello, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Okay, can you get in there with him? I've been there trying to do mouth to mouth, but he's cold and stiff, really cold and stiff. And I've been gone all day hunting for him because he's got a lot of mental problems and he likes to go down to Durham and Raleigh. And he was picked up, well, wasn't picked up, but he was stopped by the Apex police about a year ago because it was like four in the morning and okay. he was out there. Okay, so you're he was going to go to the gang areas and get killed because he doesn't want to die of his lymphoma. Okay. Do you have a cell phone at all, ma'am? Yeah, but it died. It died? Okay, what's your name? Jolene Hardy. Jolene Harvey? Hardy, H-A-R-D-Y. Okay. All right, at last you were with him. I'm just going to ask you some questions. How old is he? He's 60 years old. Okay. Please sit down before I fall down. Okay, I, I have them on the way to you. I'm just going to talk to you while they're on the way. And I'm at my neighbor's house right now because 
I tried all that time to resuscitate him, and he's so cold, and I couldn't stand it anymore. So I came over here because it finally dawned on me I wasn't getting anywhere with it. And he just got colder, so... I, uh... Okay. I've been hunting for him all last night and all day. I haven't had any sleep. Okay. I've been doing these things for six years since he got the little okay. phone. last you were over there with him, was he awake? No, he was as cold as a bone. And, was he and breathing? Stiff. No, he's stiff and cold as a bone. And I went and blew in his mouth and, and nothing happens because his chest don't rise or nothing because he's already cold. Okay. You know, do you think he's beyond any help? Oh, God, yes. Okay. I've never seen a dead person outside of a coffin. Okay. And then I had to put my mouth on his, and it was so cold, and he, he's got his teeth all knocked out, his, and he's all beat up looking. His teeth are knocked out, and he's beat up looking? Yes, because he hangs out. Sometimes he goes down to Ralph in Durham. And he walks, and one time a year ago, or so the apex cops saw him at four in the morning heading toward Raleigh, and they stopped him and talked to him, and he said, is there a law against me okay. walking down the street at four in the morning? And they said, well, no. And he said, well, I'm not a window peeper or nothing, and okay. uh, can't okay. I be on my way? And they said, yes. Jolene, when's the last time you saw him? I saw him early. This morning, or not this morning, yesterday morning. And then he took off somewhere, evidently, that evening. When's the last time did, you were home? The la I, <laughs> last time I was home. Yes, ma'am. I've been out all night looking for him, and all day looking for him. Okay. And I got my house, at my house about 3, I'm guessing about 3.30. 3.30 this morning? No, no, this afternoon. Okay. Before 3.30 this afternoon, when's yeah, the last time out. you were physically home? At what time? When is the last time you were home? Inside? Last, yes. The last time I was home? Uh-huh. I was home once early morning, and he wasn't there then. But when I come back now, he is. Uh, Okay, and you've been doing CPR since you came at 3.30? What's that? You've been doing CPR yes, since 3.30? Yes, I have. Uh, but I got, uh, I got uh, heart condition and high blood pressure and cholesterol, and I got sugar diabetes a little bit, and I couldn't breathe deep enough. But, I mean, he was already stiff and cold, so he's been laying there. He had to come home sometime in the morning time, or the, you know, not early morning, but later morning, because I just went in there about, I'm guessing it was 3.30. And okay, is that the ambulance I hear pulling up? Yes, they're here. I'll okay, talk go ahead and talk to now. them. Go talk to them. All right. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye. A preliminary autopsy report determined Gerald Hardy died of blunt force trauma from a beating. Once search warrants were obtained to get inside the Hardy home, Sheriff Donnie Harrison said, quote, We saw things that did not look right. Unquote. Police found Gerald Hardy lying on the kitchen floor, and court documents state there were obvious signs of rigor mortis setting in. When questioned, despite the sobs and long-winded explanation on her 911 call, Jolene Hardy ended up confessing to investigators that she fought with her husband and struck him in the head, face, and body with a hammer. She told police that after her husband lost consciousness, she cleaned up the blood from his body and the scene. After her confession, Hardy was arrested and booked on the early morning of July 17, 2009. Investigators did not comment on a motive of the murder, but seized several items from the home and got a search warrant for financial and cell phone records. Hardy was arrested on a charge of first-degree murder, but then in December of 2010, a judge ruled Hardy was not competent enough to stand trial in the beating death of her husband. 
In Palm Coast, Florida, on April 13, 2019, a call came in around 12.30 a.m. from a man telling the dispatcher his friend, 18-year-old Curtis Israel Gray, was just shot. The caller answers the dispatcher's questions while continuing to help Gray, repeatedly telling him, quote, stay with me, stay with me, unquote. Gray was immediately airlifted to a trauma hospital with a gunshot wound to his stomach, but he later died. The friend stated that the man who shot Gray fled the scene in a dark-colored SUV with three other people in it. Twitter lit up with a great deal of tweets mourning the young man's death, accompanied with the hashtag, Long Live Curtis. Gray was a senior at Flagler Palm Coast High School, where he ran track and played football. He was only less than 45 days from graduating. April 13, 2019, 35, 29. Fire County 911, what's the location of your emergency? We had a throat shot by a, 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 a what's it called, kangaroo. My friend just got shot. At the kangaroo? Yes, by, uh, by the gas station, by um, oh. kangaroo. And okay. Okay, listen to me. Where, listen, being, being on the phone with me is not going to slow them down, okay? I need you to give me information. Where is he bleeding from? In his chest, in his chest. We got, uh... Is he awake? Uh, he's trying to... How is he? Listen. Hey, what is your name? What is it? Listen to me. Can you get something to apply pressure or is somebody else already applying pressure? Okay, who shot him? We don't know. I see, I see people in the car. I see Frank. You see Frank? That's, that's Frank. Oh, my God. Yes, you know who it is. You know who, who was it? Tell me who it was. It was, it was, uh, it was this kid, Frank, and he's in a car with two other, he's in a car with three other people. It's a girl. It's two females. They in a, uh, truck. They in, uh, a green, a green truck. Okay, tell me what kind of car it was. Is it black? No, it's green. It's green. It's green. A green Chevy. Is it an SUV? Yeah, SUV. It's a girl driving. And which direction did it go? They went towards BCMS. BCMS. Okay, listen to me. You're doing a really good job. We have help on the way. The more information you can give me about Frank, the better, so that we can find him. What is Frank's last name? Uh, I don't know his last name, but I know it was a, it's a girl driving the truck. It's a white dude in the front, and then there's two other people in the back. Okay. And is Frank black, white, or Hispanic? Oh, is the person that's down or the people that's riding? No, it's Frank, the suspect, the, the guy that shot your friend, is he black, white, or Hispanic? We don't know who it is because it was, it was, uh, there were four cars deep. And no, there were four people deep. What's your name, sir? Okay. And it was, okay, and somebody is, what is your friend's name? Kurt, his name is Curtis Gray. Curtis Gray. Curtis Gray. Yeah, and they went towards BKMS. Oh my okay, you're doing a really good job. I have a lot of people coming to help you, and we're going to find Frank, too, okay? Do you have any idea where Frank may have been headed? They're in a big-ass SUV towards BTMS way. Do you know where he lives or where any of those girls live? P-section, 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 P-section. Into the P-section? Yes, they live in the P-section. Rope off the P-section. They live in the P-section. Okay. Okay. Okay, we're we've got them pulling up on scene. I want you to find an officer and give them all that information. We're having them look for Frank as well, okay? Bye, bye, bye. You did a really good job. 
The day of the shooting, Sheriff Rick Staley announced that 17-year-old Marion Gavins Jr. was a suspect in the murder. Gavins was allegedly in the back seat of the SUV that fled the scene. His mother convinced him to turn himself in around 3 p.m. on Sunday, April 14th, and he was charged with first-degree murder. In a video of himself posted on Snapchat before he turned himself in, Gavins explains that after words were exchanged between the boys, he claims Gray reached in his pocket first, implying that he was going to pull out a weapon. This post I'm going to be posting on Snapchat, you feel me? Y'all niggas about to turn stuff in, you feel me? You know, niggas don't even know the situation, what happened, you feel me? Everybody expect me to be the bad person. I'm gonna get I ain't even the bad person, you feel me? Okay. Nigga reached first, fuck these niggas talking about, you feel me? I ain't worried about none of that I, shit. I'm gonna stay solid, all the way, you feel me? Say shit, break shit, fuck around y'all, bitch that nigga, you feel me? I'm fucking moving, you feel me? I'm gonna keep this shit solid all the way. And if you wanna test me, Fuck it, it is what it is, you feel me? I never fall, you feel me? I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die by mine, bro. These are facts, you feel me? So, for y'all niggas talking about, you feel me? You got pressure, let me know, you feel me? I ain't hiding from none of y'all niggas, you feel me? I go ahead and hand them mine, you feel me? So, ain't, ain't no one for taking my charges at me, you feel me? I'm gonna do that shit like a real nigga. I ain't worried about none of y'all bitch ass fuck niggas hating on me, bro. Y'all niggas act like y'all fucking knew that nigga, you ain't fucking know that nigga, bro, you feel me? I know nigga more than y'all, all y'all niggas knew that nigga, you feel me? Y'all even know the fucking situation, y'all just assume shit. Y'all wanna dick ride and post and fucking repost shit and everything, you feel me? I don't even know what the fuck happened, bro. You feel me? I'm keep that shit. I'm still on my shit. Authorities found no weapon on or near Gray. Gavin's Jr. has a criminal record dating back to 2014 at the age of 13 years old, including a domestic violence arrest possessing a weapon on a school campus, and selling marijuana within 1,000 feet from a school. Gavin's turned 18 on May 16th, and even though the murder took place before his birthday, the Flagler County Sheriff is hoping he will be charged as an adult. On September 4th, 2010, in Mashpee, Massachusetts, Brent McFarlane called 911, telling the dispatcher his fiance, Kate Gill, was choking to death. After a night of drinking, McFarlane and his fiance returned home and went to bed around 11.30. A few hours later, McFarlane woke up and found his fiance was not in bed, then heard noises coming from the kitchen. He went to investigate the noises and discovered Gil on the floor choking on several large marshmallows. Just before 2 a.m., McFarlane quickly made his desperate 12-minute call to 911, in which periods of silence can be heard from the dispatcher's end. He begs the dispatcher for help as he watches his fiancée go unconscious, turn blue, and eventually become unresponsive. The dispatcher, Rhonda Colburn, mentions the Heimlich once and initially asked a few questions but did not respond to McFarland's pleas and did not instruct him any further. Ambulances were dispatched 53 seconds after the call came in, but because of the lack of road signs on McFarland's private road and it being a stormy night in the midst of Hurricane Earl, they were delayed in their arrival. 911 recorded line, what is your emergency, police, fire, or medical? Medical, please. What do you need? You need the police? I need, I need, I need, I need, I need my girlfriend choking. Your girlfriend shot you? No, oh, she's choking to death. Okay, what's the address? 52 Road. What is she choking on? No idea, she's going to come out. She what? Oh, at the house. Oh, okay. Do you know the Heimlich? <laughs> what is your name? Yes, I'm her mouth, her mouth. She won't respond. What's the phone number? 539-2443. Okay, is she breathing at all? No, she's not breathing. She's not talking to her, please. All right, the ambulance is on its way. Kate. Kate. How old is she? She's 39 years old. Kate. She won't open her mouth. She won't open her mouth? And her mouth open. She's seizing. She's seizing? She's not breathing. Okay, she's not breathing. Okay. 
All right, what was she choking on? I can't hear you because you're on a speakerphone. She's 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 peeing her pants now. Okay. What was she choking on? I don't know. Okay, you need to calm down. Okay, the ambulance is on its way. Okay. Okay. Where is she in the bathroom? No, she's on the kitchen floor. She's on the kitchen floor. Yep. Okay. Does she take any medications or anything? I have no idea. Yep. Okay. Okay. I have no idea. She, she, don't do this to me, Kate. She, she, can you breathe? Is she breathing? I can't tell. You can't tell? Her, her tongue is swollen. Her tongue is swollen? Ugh. <sighs> How's her color? Huh? Her lips are blue. Her lips are blue? Yes, they are. She said, I still got a little light there. Did she, is, did she, does she have a history of seizures? I have no idea. You have no idea? Do you think she took anything? No. Well, we, I don't know. You guys are coming over here right away. you at all? Uh, I think she's, she's right. She's barely alive. She what? She's barely alive. Okay, the ambulance is on its way. Well, but you know where I'm at. Hey, don't, hey, don't. Don't 
can't go. Don't do this, kid. I can't get her. I'm marrying her. Dave, don't leave me. Come on, Kate. Come on, Kate. You can do this. Stay with me. Stay with me. Stay with me, Kate. Stay with me. Stay with me, Kate. Do not go anywhere, Kate. Stay with me, Kate. Stay with me, Kate. Stay with me, Kate. Kate, no, 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 Kate. Stay with me. Stay with me. Frank, does she respond to you? No, she can't talk. Okay. Can she, oh. the, how about her eyes? Do her eyes flutter? Her eyes are glowing off into her skull. The pupils are not fixed to dilate. Well, they're starting to dilate. They're, they're starting to stick. Kate, no, no. Kate. No, Kate, no. Kate, don't go. Kate, no. No, Kate, no.
for it. According to McFarland, the dispatcher never asked if Kate's chest was rising, if air was entering her body freely, or if she was able to speak or cry, which are all questions suggested in the dispatcher's instructions. Despite efforts to revive her, Kate Gill later died at Falmouth Hospital that night on September 4th, which was just days after McFarland proposed to her. Gill's official cause of death was asphyxiation caused by choking on food bolus while intoxicated. In the aftermath, McFarlane filed suit August 28th on both the town of Mashpee and the dispatcher. He blamed the town for unmarked road signs that delayed the rescuers that night and the dispatcher for not instructing McFarland how to help save his fiance. The suit mentions he wanted to recover directly for the emotional distress he experienced from the incident. Judge Christopher Muse said the way the dispatcher handled the call, quote, caused some serious consequences and could certainly be considered negligent or even reckless, unquote. In November, Sheriff James Cummings admitted the dispatcher failed to follow proper procedures and in December of 2010, he announced the dispatcher's resignation. Despite the dispatcher resigning, McFarland said that brought him no comfort and he wished she would have instead been fired. Then, in 2016, in the summary judgment of McFarland v. Town of Mashpee, it was stated, quote, The town was entitled to immunity from suit under the Massachusetts Tort Claims Act, Chapter 258, and that McFarland could not recover from the town as a bystander to his girlfriend's death where his distress was truly caused by her death and not by any affirmative action of the town, unquote. Judge Rufo acknowledged that the original cause of Gill's death was her ingesting the marshmallow and subsequent choking. Nothing the town did or didn't do could be considered to originally causing this unfortunate chain of events. McFarland says he's tried his best to move on, focusing on work and spending time with family and friends, filling his days with distractions since that night his fiance died in his arms. In the early morning hours on June 29, 2017, a 911 call came in from 45-year-old Ronald Lee McMullen, telling dispatchers that his 22-year-old daughter shot herself in the face. His daughter, Kaylee McMullen, had been staying with her parents at the 1700 block of Abe Martin Drive in Norman, Oklahoma, where the incident occurred. When officers arrived at the home, they discovered McMullen's wife, Karen, trying to resuscitate her daughter, with McMullen standing by, wearing a shirt soaked in blood. Kaylee had gone on a date that night, and text messages recovered from Ronald McMullen's phone showed him telling her that she needed to come home, and that if she did not head home quickly, he would drive to the date and get her. Kaylee left her date and arrived back home around 1 a.m. Officials believe she was shot sometime between 5.15 and 5.30 a.m., but her father did not call 911 until 5.45. Norman 911, what's the location of your emergency? Uh oh. Hey, Martin. Hey, Martin? Yes. Your name and phone number? Uh, Ronnie McMullen, um, 360 
Okay, what's the problem there? My daughter is shot. Your daughter was shot? Yes, just just come to this address, sir, please. Sir, do not hang up. Did she do it to herself? Yes. Tony, okay. Is there any way she can still be alive? I don't know. Thank you. I don't know what to do. I'm Okay, sir, so I'm trying to help you. Try and stay calm, okay? Just We're, come here. Sir, they are on the way. You talking to me is not slowing them down, okay? Okay. Okay, where is she shot at? In the face. How old is she? 22. Okay. Can you see her breathing at all? No. Okay. Is she cold or changing color? Do you know? I don't know. Okay. I just don't know. Okay. Are you are you able to go to her to find out if she's breathing? Yes. Okay. Let me know when you are by her. I'm by her. Okay. Do you see or feel any breathing? She is not breathing. Okay. Do you know, did you hear a shot? Yes. Okay, so this just happened? Uh, yes. Okay. Do you want us to try CPR? I guess, yeah. Okay. Is she flat on the ground? Yes. Okay. Again, there is help on the way to, to help you, okay? Okay. I want you to lay her flat on her back, on the ground. She's on her back. Okay. Again, I, I moved her from where she was into the living room. Okay. I want you to place your hand on her forehead, your other hand under, yes. your other hand under her neck, and tilt the, help, the head back. Okay. Put your ear next to her mouth. Can you feel or hear any breathing? She's gone. I'm telling you, she's gone. Okay. She's not breathing. Okay, so you don't think we should try CPR? I don't know. I'm pushing on her chest. I'm just telling you, she's gone. Okay. Do you know how to do CPR? Kind of. I just, I don't know what to do. Okay. Again, they are on the way to help you, okay? I don't know what to do. I think she's gone. What, what, do you know what kind of gun it was, sir? It's a pistol. Do you know a caliber? Uh, 38, 357. 38 pistol. Okay. I want you to pump her chest hard and fast at least twice per second, two inches deep. Okay. I'm doing it. Okay. Let the chest come all the way up between pumps. You're going to do this yes. 100 times or until the fire department's there to take over for you, okay? Okay. Are you able to get that meal there? Count out loud so I can stay aware of where you're at. Okay, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, sixty, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine, seventy. Okay, at least twice per second, okay? We need to speed up just a little bit. Okay. Hard and fast, at least twice per second and two inches deep, yes. okay? Yes. My wife's a nurse. She's, she's performing CPR. Your wife is doing CPR now? Yes. Okay. Is she is she going to be calm enough to do CPR, sir? She's doing CPR. Okay. Can I get off the phone now? If you can get 
it down so I can hear this thing. I, I cannot hear you. If you can just keep an open line with me, okay? Is your, no, is your, I'm just going to get off the phone. I can sure. hear the sirens. My wife is here. Okay, is They'll the, be here in a minute. Sir, is the door unlocked for them? Yes. All right. Okay. When emergency workers responded to the McMullen home, cops were immediately suspicious that Ronnie McMullen was involved. He was covered in blood and stared blankly when officers asked him questions. According to the responding officers, McMullen let his wife answer the questions for him. Kaylee's body was in the home's entryway and a blood-spattered 357 revolver was found on a side table. McMullen agreed to an interview with Norman police detectives where he told them that Kaylee had been playing with a loaded gun and shot herself in the face. When asked if he would take a polygraph, McMullen did not consent. After a preliminary investigation, even though gunshot residue was found on her hands, detectives believed Kaylee could not have died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. McMullen was then arrested on July 5, 2017, on a charge of first-degree murder where he pleaded not guilty. His trial began on September 24, 2019, where several friends of Kaylee's testified that she told them she had a rocky relationship with her father. They recall Kaylee telling them her father slapped her in the face and made her nosebleed during an argument in April of 2017, where then Kaylee's mother grabbed a gun and pointed it at McMullen and threatened to kill him if he touched her daughter again. After that argument, McMullen allegedly slipped into Kaylee's bed that night and tried to touch her inappropriately. When Kaylee's mother, Karen, took the stand, she denied that her husband abused their daughter and denied ever pulling a gun on him. Text messages provided during the trial by prosecutors showed Kaylee discussing the alleged events with her friends in the days that followed. Her mother also testified at the trial that Kaylee had trouble living with them and following the house rules, which caused a lot of tension. During the murder investigation, it was found out that McMullen was also accused of inappropriately touching his daughter back in 2007, and records showed an investigation took place, but no charges were ever filed. McMullen's lawyer, Michael Johnson, argued that Kaylee shot herself and the gunshot residue on her hand supported that theory, but prosecutors disputed that claim. Then, on October 2, 2019, after the two-week trial concluded, a jury deliberated for four hours and returned with a guilty verdict. Court officials said that Karen McMullen broke out into tears and sobbed uncontrollably when the verdict was read. Ronnie McMullen is due back in court in early December, facing life imprisonment without the possibility for parole.